Welcome to Stingray Tom's Florida and another dip into the archives. Today I'll be talking about Florida's participation in several of the world's fairs that were held in the 20th century. These fairs were valuable forms of advertising for the state, and it's clear that the Florida government understood that. I'll be showing dozens of archival images like usual, of course, but I wanted to start with this book. Curiously, while it was written and photographed for the state of Florida to be used at the 1939 New York's World Fair, it contains little information about Florida's involvement in the fair. This 130-page soft-bound book tells the story of Florida itself, its history, nature, agriculture, industry, and tourism. This is the real story behind Florida's participation in the world's fairs. Many other states, foreign countries, and private companies used the World's Fairs in the same manner. While this was partly for the masses of fair visitors, after all, Florida wanted the public to visit St. Augustine in Miami, as well as buy oranges and pure cane sugar, but it was also for the elite, the men, who controlled millions of dollars instead of just hundreds. These captains of industry and government officials were the audience for this book. In the wake of World War I, Florida began to spend millions every year to get the state developed into industrial and agricultural power. So moving beyond, I'll be looking at Florida's involvement in the 1933 Chicago Fair and the two fairs in New York in 1939 and 64. I'll show just how impressive these fairs were and what Florida's participation was. Even though the state's population was small compared to today, visitors at the three fairs saw Florida's large and dramatic shows, displays, and architecture. As you'll see, the state and its business partners spared little expense when it came to promoting Florida to the country and indeed the world. So join me as we go to the fair. For those not familiar with the concept of a World's Fair, I'll start there. Generally, they are international exhibitions that are designed to showcase various achievements of nations. They were popular in Europe beginning in the mid-19th century and found their way to the U.S. not too much later. The first in America was the World's Columbian Exposition held in Chicago in 1893 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's first transatlantic voyage. Countries would be invited to create buildings often called pavilions, where they would share their culture and their agricultural and industrial production. Essentially, they were complex promotional exercises for the attending public. In America, some of the states would also have pavilions. The fairs included other entertainment, such as circuses, sideshows, and amusement rides. Arguably, the theme of Epcot at Walt Disney World is a permanent world fair. You can check out my recent video that includes the early days of Epcot Center here for more information. The first fair that we'll explore is the 1933 Century of Progress International Exposition in Chicago. To set the scene, Florida in 1933 was all but completely rural and had an estimated population of 1.5 million, less than 1 20th of its current population. It was beginning to significantly increase its agricultural industry, and its industrial development was far behind more populous states. Tourism was limited, especially because of the Great Depression. Prior to that, most tourists came to Florida either by steamship or railway, and the majority were wealthy and would come down for all or part of the winter season. The Origins of Florida's Snowbirds Florida had remarkable potential, however, and it was clear that the state understood that point when they signed up to have a momentous presence at the Chicago World's Fair. 
The fair was a financial and popular success, and it set the bar rather high for future world's fairs. Located on the shore of Lake Michigan, it was one of the largest world's fairs ever to be held in the U.S. It certainly came at an interesting time. 1933 saw the world struggling through the worst part of the Depression. Adolf Hitler had recently become German Chancellor, and Franklin D. Roosevelt had been elected U.S. President. He would go on to lead America out of the Depression and through World War II. The exposition entertained some 48 million visitors over the 11 months it ran through the summer and fall of both 1933 and 1934. It took place on 427 acres or 1.7 square kilometers of land reclaimed from Lake Michigan. Florida had a larger presence at the fair than most of the other states. As it reads on page 91 of the fair's guidebook, Florida has four exhibits, a colorful patio of a Florida residence surmounted by a sky of varying daily tints. In the center plays a fountain. Sculptures, murals, dioramas, and glassed-in exhibits tell of her farm and industrial life, supplemented by a garden of exotic plants and trees. On the lagoon shore, the state has planted a citrus grove of orange and other semi-tropical fruits. On the lagoon floats a sponge boat from the Greek colony at Tarpon Springs, where divers plunge beneath the waters for sponges planted on the lagoon. In the home and industrial arts area is a Florida home, built largely of materials native to the state. Located in the Midway, there was also a Florida-sponsored Seminole Indian Village display that included alligator wrestling in a recreation of an alligator farm similar to several that were popular in the state. Behind the agricultural group, the huge buildings that promoted America's agricultural wonders and advancements, there was a transplanted exhibit known as the Florida Gardens, and described as one of the finest collections of its kind ever assembled. It contained orange, grapefruit, and lemon trees, along with thousands of other tropical and semi-tropical plants. The Florida Tropical House was created for the Fair's Homes of Tomorrow exhibition to entice new residents to the state. It was designed by a well-known Miami architect, Robert Law Weed. The construction was carried out by the Digard and Preston construction firm for about $15,000. It was said to be designed for climates approximating that of Florida and was built upon a concrete slab, an advancement that modern Florida builders would embrace. Also, like many Florida residences, its exterior was stucco and painted pink. While it was supposed to have been made of concrete walls as well, it had a wood frame. It featured a two-story living room overlooked by a balcony. Additionally, it had an overhanging balcony with access to a terrace. After the fair, the house was moved to a lot on Lake Michigan in Beverly Shores, Indiana, where it joined five of the other homes of tomorrow. It stands today and was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1986. Less than five years later, it was New York's turn to have the next notable American exhibition and give the U.S. our colloquial name for them. Yes, the 1939 New York World's Fair was, for the first time, officially named World's Fair. The first of New York City's great fairs was much like Chicago's Century of Progress, though it took a different approach, one less focused on technology and aimed more at cultural themes and social progress. This was a poignant difference considering that much of the world was already in the midst of or soon would be pulled into World War II. Florida's population had grown by about 500,000, a 25% increase in about five years. Florida's pavilion and exhibition space at the fair measured 2.5 acres or one hectare, likely the largest area dedicated to a U.S. state. It was on the west shore of Fountain Lake, and it was an attempt to recreate Florida's tropical paradise. Intriguingly, Florida was located near the sprawling amusement section, it was on Orange Blossom Lane, pretty much by itself, on the opposite side of the lake from the amusements. Visitors experienced Florida's natural and human-made points of interest, along with advances in art, science, and industry. The Florida promotional book I mentioned before shows a great deal of the types of subjects covered in the pavilion, including tongue oil, turpentine, pineapples, tobacco, celery, cigars, phosphate, and sponges. 
If that list doesn't strike you as significant Florida companies today, each of those products were quite important in the 1930s. Naturally, the state was also a leader in lumber, cattle, citrus, fish, and sugarcane. The pavilion contained numerous large dioramas, illustrating St. Augustine's Old City Gates, the Suwannee River, horse racing, a turpentine farm, lumber mill, phosphate mine, and paper mill, plus hunting and fishing scenes. There were displays of seashells, birds, sponges, sport fish, honey, citrus, lumber, and handicrafts. There were also displays representing Florida's tourism industry, including Bach Tower Gardens, Silver Springs, Wakula Springs, Marine Studios, the St. Augustine Alligator and Ostrich Farm, Sunken Gardens, McKee Gardens, Ringling Art Museum, and Cypress Gardens, all of which are still operating as of 2021. The tower that was the focal point of Florida's pavilion contained the world's largest carillon, a giant bell instrument played on a keyboard. This carillon even rated its own brochure as can be seen here. The brochure was created by the instrument's maker, J.C. Deegan Incorporated, of Chicago. The company was founded in 1880, and since 1984, it's owned by the Yamaha Corporation. At the fair, the carillon was made up of 75 tubular bells, an innovation created by the manufacturer. Costing about $120,000, the carillon was set up to have three bells for each note in the instrument. More than a year was required by craftsmen to build the huge instrument. After the fair, the carillon was dismantled. It would make its way to northern Florida and be installed in another tower at the Stephen Foster Memorial on the banks of the Suwannee River near White Springs, as can be seen by the brochure. However, this would take nearly 30 years. Due to World War II and other issues, the tower was only finally built in 1957 and the carillon installed in 1958. By then, the total number of tubular bells had increased to 97. It's still there in what is now known as the Stephen Foster Folk Culture Center State Park. Not surprisingly, it plays songs written by the most famous antebellum composer who famously never set foot in Florida, and who chose the Suwannee River as a location for his song, Old Folks at Home, because his brother, Morrison, suggested it. The song has been a Florida state song since 1935, even though it clearly has racist overtones. Open 25 years after the premiere of the first New York's World's Fair, the 1964 version saw a nation radically different from the pre-war era. Europe was being rebuilt and moving towards a healthy economy. America's economy was likewise booming, and the only war much of the world worried about was the Cold War. New York City was now considered the capital of the world. It was even the home of the United Nations. So it made sense to have the city host another World's Fair. Florida's population was burgeoning in the 50s and 60s. It went from 1.9 million in 1940 to an estimated 5.4 million in 1964. At the time, the fastest growing state with an economy to match. As I've said before, the 50s and the 60s was also the golden era for Florida tourism. The old pre-war attractions were mature parks and there were dozens of new and diverse attractions being born out of the creativity of Florida businessmen and women. The World's Fair saw several attractions contribute to the Florida participation, including the water ski show. One might guess it was created by Cypress Gardens, but it was actually produced by Tommy Bartlett, who owned the popular Deer Ranch attraction at Silver Springs. Why Mr. Deer Ranch handled the fair's water skiing makes more sense when you know that Bartlett became first famous for running water ski shows, such as his water ski and jumping boat thrill show a long-running former attraction in the Wisconsin Dells. The fair's water ski show was held in the $25 million, 1,600-seat amphitheater that was located next to the Florida Pavilion. Between the two, Florida held the largest acreage in the fair. Dick Pope, owner of Cypress Gardens, was rather busy anyway. He was tapped by Florida's governor to be the president of the Florida World's Fair Authority and he had his own responsibilities. In the 1960s, Pope was 
probably the most famous attraction owner in Florida and was one of the essential promoters of Florida in this country and world. Choosing him to be the president of the Florida World's Fair Authority illustrates just how important Florida's attraction community was to the state. This time Florida had another tower, a 110 foot or 34 meter tall tower topped by a giant plastic orange which stood over dozens of palm trees and a pair of sizable carousel shaped structures. The semi-tropical setting included a large state exhibit hall as well as the porpoise pool. There were some 10 porpoise shows a day that were presented by the Miami Seaquarium. Promoted as the second smartest mammals, the porpoises played basketball, danced, and leaped through the air, thrilling thousands of visitors every day. There was also a home site area on the shore of the Fairs Lake, which included model houses that was reached by a boardwalk known as the Bridge to the Keys. There was a full-size furnished house that sat near several scale model homes set in a garden. Nearby was Flamingo Isle, not surprisingly featuring flamingos. Then there were also two buildings that rested on pilings in a lake that contained the Florida Development Commission and the Minute Maid Company. The exhibit hall contained art from both private and public Florida collections and exhibits relating to Florida's communities, industry, agriculture, sports, and education. Considering the importance of the space program in the 1960s, there was a large area which detailed Florida's unique role in space exploration. One of the more unusual Florida connections with the fair was a record album. Produced by the state for the fair, it contained 11 original songs that touted the charm and beauty of the Sunshine State. Titled Florida Melodies, it features the Johnny Lighton Orchestra, the Freund Singers, and soloist Kathy Kent. Unfortunately, nothing more than what is on the back cover of the album appears to be available on any of the performers. In fact, I have not been able to gather any real information about the songs or the project, including the composer Ruben Yoakum. Now, the point of this channel isn't to critique music. But once listening to the album, I'd say it's pretty clear that it's far from the best album of 1964. Certainly, it's no hard day's night. The clip at the beginning of the video is a song named Hello, Florida, Hello. I'll play clips from two other songs. The first is Meet Me in Florida at the World's Fair in New York. The second is Florida Intercoastal Waterway. As you can see, the actual waterway that runs within much of the coast of Florida is the Intracoastal. Goodness knows why this mistake was made. Intra is a prefix which means on the inside and refers to the fact that it's composed of rivers, estuaries, and canals to create a protected waterway along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts. In addition to the Florida offerings in 1964, there were a couple future connections with the state. The one most people wouldn't be aware of 
was the display of the sailing ship named the Bounty. Built in 1960 for the movie Mutiny on the Bounty, the extraordinary ship was constructed in Nova Scotia, Canada for $750,000 and was based on the original plans for the infamous 18th century British ship. On its journey to Tahiti, where filming took place, it traveled through the Panama Canal, as pictured in the National Geographic article about the ship. After the film was finished, the bounty was scheduled to be burned, but actor Marlon Brando protested, so Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer kept the vessel. It embarked on a worldwide promotional tour, including attending the World's Fair. Eventually, the ship was berthed in St. Petersburg as a permanent tourist attraction, where she stayed until the mid-1980s. The most obvious future Florida connection would likely be tied to the immense influence Walt Disney would have on the fair at the same time he was planning his most ambitious project, Walt Disney World. Disney's involvement in the fair was so significant that some people refer to it as Disney's fair. Always one to try and get as much out of business dealings as he could, Disney designed attractions for the fair that could later be moved to Disneyland in California, attractions that were paid for by other people. Disney created It's a Small World with funding from Pepsi-Cola for their pavilion in honor of UNICEF. As the guidebook states, A Salute to the Children of the World presents animated figures frolicking in miniature settings of many lands. Visitors are carried past the scenes in small boats. In an adjoining building, Pepsi sponsors exhibits by the U.S. Committee for the United Nations Children's Fund. For General Electric, Disney developed the Carousel of Progress, which is considered the longest-running stage show in American theater as it opened at the fair and has run first in Disneyland and later in the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World most years ever since. For Ford Motor Company, they designed the time tunnel to prehistoric times along the Magic Skyway, which included animated dinosaurs and actual Ford cars that visitors could ride while viewing Disney's creations. For the Illinois State Pavilion, Disney created a life-size animated figure that looked, acted, and spoke like the 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Highly advanced for the time, the audio-animatronic figure performed in a 500-seat theater. During the show, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, he recited excerpts from the president's speeches on liberty, civil rights, and freedom. Performing five times an hour, the figure was capable of more than 250,000 combinations of actions, including smiles, frowns, and gestures. Both the Carousel of Progress and It's a Small World were duplicated for the Magic Kingdom. The 1964 fair was arguably the last of the great world's fairs to be held in the U.S. It counted over 51 million visitors in an operating time of two six-month seasons, over two years. There were four additional fairs held in the U.S., San Antonio in 1968, Spokane in 74, Knoxville in 82, and New Orleans in 1984, each running for six months, but only averaging seven million guests. Eventually, the cost of putting on a fair versus the return on the expense became a large enough roadblock that future world's fairs have only been held outside the U.S., there was at least one interesting Florida connection with these later fairs. After the closing of the 1984 Louisiana World Exposition in New Orleans, its monorail system was reused at the Miami Metro Zoo. It continues to operate as of 2021. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel to learn more about the history of Florida tourism. Stingray Tom's Florida, traveling through time around the Sunshine State.